Okay, so the next little part, of it, I've just got some slides uh, that I had actually prepared when I taught finite elements to mechanical engineers. So the applications are more mechanical, but nevertheless, these are very general and, and it, you know, it, 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 it doesn't really matter uh, what the applications are. So of course, what we want to do, um, you know, we have a very complex system, like take, for instance, this engine, right? Well, how do you write down all of the coupled multi-physics equations that describe everything that's happening in the engine? The deformation in the cylinder walls uh, due to heat and stress and everything else, you know, we don't have closed form solutions to that. So we have to re resort to a computer, and the way we do that is we do it through discretization. And so the image on the right, and this, by the way, uh, is actually a real finite element model of that engine. This is not some cartoon. Uh, I have a, a colleague who worked at GM for 10 years, and he provided me with this. And in fact, just to create this mesh, and if you don't know what a mesh is, don't worry, we'll talk about it, but just to create that mesh is months worth of work, just to mesh it, not even to, to solve the equations, right? So uh, uh, GM has, you know, little contractors that, that basically their whole business is to create these geometries and mesh them, so. So this is a more philosophical, you know, this is probably more appropriate for the very first day of a course. Uh, but, you know, like I said, today we're sort of switching gears so that you can think of this as the first day of the, of the computing or the, the finite element part of the course. And we're, we're going to come full circle and we'll solve those equations later. But I always like this quote. Uh, many of you might have seen the numerical recipes book that a lot of us use uh, probably, you know, for, for different algorithms if you do a little bit of coding. But one of the authors of that is this guy Hamming, and his quote is, you know, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. And, and I really like that. I think that, you know, a lot of times we, we do computations um, uh, with the sort of intention to get an answer. But a lot of times because of uncertainty and other things, it's, it's sort of questionable how much we should really believe those answers and what we should really use computing for is insight. And so I, I really like that, and, and you could extend that not just to, just to computing, but to just say analysis, right? The, the purpose of analysis is insight, right? So again, it's sort of a philosophy type lecture, but you know, so what is analysis? Well, it, you know, it means to break up, and I like that because you know, in Greek it means to break up, and that's exactly what we do in finite elements. We, we break up the problem, right? And so, you know, an informal definition might be, for analysis, of course, would be to, to probe into or simulate nature. And so why do we want to do analysis? Well, and again, this lecture was prepared really for mechanical engineers, and, and so in the context of, like, mechanical design. But nevertheless, I mean, we do design and petroleum engineering, right? We, 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 at sort of a larger scale, we hope to design, you know, do reservoir engineering and other things, right? Uh, design stimulation procedures and and all of that stuff, and we can use analysis to help us, okay? So what is an effective design? It's one that works, right? That's it, right? If you have a design that works, it's effective, okay? Well, maybe, maybe not, so let's, let's look at a design and see how effective it is. All right, so it's just a little fun there. Uh, basically to say that, um, you know, an effective de design is not simply one that works, right? It's one that poor, performs the task efficiently, you might say, in, in a better, so, you know, it has to work, of course, but that's not, a, that's a necessary but not sufficient condition. Uh, effective design is one that's economical, right? So if we're interested in a metal that is uh, ductible and easily machinable, ductile and easily machinable and easily extruded and deformable, well, we might use gold. It, it meets all of those qualities, right? But it's not cheap, and copper also meets all of those qualities, right? So, and this is particularly important in our business, right? I mean, we have to find a way to get this, like the cost of stimu reservoir stimulation down, or it's quite frankly probably not sustainable. So, economics is is sort of the heart uh, of most petroleum engineers. I mean, 
safe. This is also important, right? And here I have an example of a famous Alaskan Airlines flight with the fuselage ripped off, and, and uh, thankfully no one was hurt. But can you imagine flying in that plane and landing that way? <laughs> uh, but of course, in our business too, right? I mean, safety is important. Uh, we don't want to get anyone hurt, and there's also kind of the public pu public image uh, uh, that that can have an adverse effect if bad things happen. Um, this is, you know, of course, important in, in everything. This is another example from the automobile industry. But you know, we can design things quite easily that really can't be manufactured, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, th this could be the same in, in reservoir engineering. Uh, you know, I, I could think of quite a few ways to really stimulate reservoirs, but not preserve wellbore stability and quite a few other things that are, imp are important so that we can actually produce oil and gas, right? And uh, this is probably less, uh, less important in, in our business, but, but in certainly in, in uh, consumer uh, type electronics and other things, it, it quite frankly is important that our designs are appealing. You know, I, I think of often of, you know, Apple, the, the main designer of the iPhone and I, the iMacs and stuff, this guy, Joni Ivey, like he's an industrial designer, right? And he's, he's half engineer, half artist, you know. The, I just actually got the, the iPhone 6 and it's, you know, it's quite a beautiful little piece of, you know, it feels good in your hand and it makes you happy, right, when, when you have it. So th th these things matter, you know. Not so much in petroleum engineering, but in other, where, in other places. And so, uh, you know, these are, th 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 this is the purpose of doing analysis. And, and again, what we're, the way we're going to do analysis or approach it in this course is through mathematical modeling and the computer implementation of mathematical models, right? So, you know, there we, we basically have a, a, a simple pendulum that you can build in your garage, and uh, we can model that with this sort of stick mass type uh, approach, and we can write down the equation of motion. So if we solve this equation uh, in time, right, uh, this differential equation, then we can basically have a deterministic look that approximate the motion of that pendulum. And uh, so let's look at an example from, from solid mechanics, okay? So, you know, we, we have a beam, and uh, it has a stiffness E and an area A, a length L, and we're going to apply a load P to the end of it, and we want to know what, what is the displacement, or can we write the equation of motion in terms of the displacement, okay? So let's do that. Again, I'm going to apply a load P to our beam L that says length L, area A, and Young's modulus E. And what we're interested in is when we do this, how much do we deform the beam? So what is delta? Well, it turns out you can, you probably just remember this from your solid, if, you're, if all you're interested in is the, say, the tip displacement, you probably remember this from your solid mechanics course, right, in your undergraduate. I mean, it's, it's just PL over AE. But where did that come from? Like in, sol in undergraduate solid mechanics, it just, you sort of memorize it, right? But let's see. You know, let's see if we can do a little more. I mean, what if we're interested in the displacement u at, at any random point along the bar? So like u of x, what if we're interested in that? Okay. So if we have a bar that we're going to basically say it has an arbitrary shape because we don't want to confine ourselves, our model, we don't want to confine ourselves to just a rectangular bar. If we look at just a little slice of that bar, right? So 
Now we're looking at just this little slice of the bar. And when I say little, I mean infinitesimally little, all right? And let's write, you know, if I'm pulling on it, if I'm pulling on it with the load P, right, any slice, so I guess I should write P here, any slice is going to be at equilibrium, right? So it's going to have some force here plus some force here, right? And so if we just write F equals MA, or you know, the, the sum of the forces here, we have minus F plus F plus partial F partial X dx, and that's equal to, well, what's the, what's the acceleration of this guy? We know it's uh, the mass, right? So the mass is rho A dx times the second derivative in time with respect to uh, second, the second derivative of displacement with time, right? Okay, well, the two f's cancel, right? Now we have a dx on both sides. So that cancels. And we're only going to consider for this problem the equilibrium case. Okay, so in the equilibrium case, we're not concerned with the time dependence, right? So what we're left with is simply partial, partial x, f equal to zero, all right? And we know that f, you know, from our one-dimensional definition of stress, then we can, you know, that f is equal to stress times area, and area is a function of x, right? And we also know that stress in one dimension, according to Hooke's law, is equal to E epsilon, okay? And we know that epsilon, that's our definition of strain, so we can write partial U partial X, A X, right? And so now if we plug this in to that equation, we have partial partial x e a x partial u partial x equal to zero. So this is the differential equation that we solve that, at least at the tip, leads us to this answer. Okay, but we can, with this, we can actually solve for the displacement any, anywhere along the bar. Now, we do need some boundary conditions to solve it, right? So one of the boundary conditions is going to be, I mean, if we just look at our example, right? At x equal to 0, there's no displacement, right? So at this point right here, this is x. So at x equal to 0, the displacement's fixed. So that's one boundary condition. So the way we'd write that is u at 0 equals zero. So that's a boundary condition. Okay. And then what we what do we know about this end? So at this end the displacement's not fixed, right? But what we do know is the stress. We know the stress is going to be the stress at L has got to be equal to P over the area at L, right? So whatever the area is at the end of the bar, that, that's what the stress is on the end of the bar, right? So that equation implies, you know, if we substitute in E epsilon at L equals P a over L, then that implies E partial U at L partial X equals P 
over AL. And so the way we typically write this is just rearrange it such that, so I'm just going to rearrange it, right? E A L partial U and L partial X is equal to P, all right? So there's our boundary conditions. So this is our equation that we're going to solve subject to this boundary condition and this boundary condition. And we need two boundary conditions because there's, there's two derivatives, right? So you have the partial, partial x here that's going to operate on, so you have a second derivative in uh, displacement here in this term. Okay? So I happen to not be an engineer, not a mathematician. So whenever I need to solve a differential equation, even though I remember how to do the met method of undetermined coefficients and all this nonsense, th that's a waste of time. I'm an engineer. Right? I'm going to go to the computer and I'm going let it, to let it solve it for me. Right? So turns out Mathematica can actually solve this, and not just Mathematica, MATLAB with its symbolic package, and uh, SymPy, and, and other things can solve this in closed form. You can just put in the differential equation and it'll solve it. And so that's what I've done here. So first thing I do is just define the area, uh, and you know I, I plot a picture of what it looks like. So this, in this case, I'm just considering a rectangular bar and here's where I define the differential equation of motion, and then I solve it. So this is the, this is how you solve it, and you can see, uh, subject to the boundary conditions, um, u at zero. So so here's the differential equation, okay, and I want to solve that equation with the boundary condition u at zero equals zero, and u times, two times the area. Now the two just appears there because I've defined the area only only on the, I wanted to plot it as a, that it, uh, I wanted to plot the picture such that it surrounded uh, the axis here so I, I have a factor of two in there, but that doesn't really matter. Nevertheless, here's the boundary condition, just so I've written it, and I want to solve it for u of x at x uh, with the, uh, independent variable x, and when I do, I get this solution, okay, and of course, at x equal to L, I get PL over AE, right, I get this thing, okay, so, and, but, you know, I do have the, the whole solution as a function of x, so then I can, I can plot it, right, so here's the displacement along, all along x, and but what if we don't have a cylinder, cylindrical cross-section? Now I know this is a little bit hard to see. I think this is difficult to see, but basically down here you have the equation for the area and you have the analytic solution. But with this, now I can look at, you know, what if I had a linear cross-section? Well, now you see the displacement has a, sort of a quadratic type profile. If I had a quadratic type profile for the bar, the displacement solution is different. And I can, I can make the bar longer or shorter. I can, you know, change how the area looks. And all of that changes the displacement in real time. I can even have something funny like a sinusoid, right? So this is the displacement here for that, right? So the computer can do all of that. And it turns out, in this case, all of these, you know, I mean, here's the analytic solution for this. Uh, hard to see, but it's a little messy, but we could come up with it even by hand, right? Okay. So, yeah. What?
Uh, that's not a. That's just a. That's not a dot. Yeah, you, you see when I when I wrote it here, I just wrote it like this. Yeah. That's just a. My pen hit the hit the screen, in the wrong spot, obviously. Okay. So. And there's a reason I sort of went through all that. I mean, we can write down the equation for a rectangular bar pretty easily, right? But what's the solution to this? Right? What if we have something that's completely non-uniform? What's the solution to that? We can't write it down. But what we can do is we can break it up. And that didn't show up very well. But basically, there's dashed lines here. Now, do each of these regions look familiar? I just showed you the, the, the solution to all of those, right? So this is just a rectangular region. Um, this is just rectangular region. This has a linear profile. This is that funny sinusoid. And this is, well, this is, uh, I think both of these are actually quadratic, right? So the point is, if we have some, comp some complex non-uniform domain, we can break it up into pieces such that we know the solution to those pieces. And in this case, we know the analytic solution. We can just write it down. In other cases, we can break it up into simple enough pieces that we can solve on those little small pieces. We can solve the equations, right? And then through, basically through the method of superposition, we just add them all up, add up all the individual solutions, and we can get the displacement anywhere along that bar by simply adding up the displacement that we compute for each of these with the appropriate boundary conditions. Right? And this is sort of the essence of the finite element method. So we're going to have we're going to take some complex domain and we're going to break it up into subdomains. And those little subdomains we we call elements or finite elements. And the collection of all of them we we talk about the the mesh. So the finite element mesh. So we we take this complex domain, we break it up into these little elements and the collection of that is the mesh, okay? And so over each of these finite elements we approximate the solution, okay? And we can approximate it with polynomials or sinusoidal functions or whatever we choose to do, and we'll get into the different techniques of those approximations, but we approximate the solutions and we solve for the known solutions, like in our example problem, it would be the displacements at finite points. So those would be so-called nodes. So if you imagine a a triangular element, then you'd solve for the displacements at the corners of the triangle, right? Okay? And in between, we have some approximation, right? And the idea is that as you shrink, as you shrink the mesh, right, that the approximation gets more and more accurate over smaller and smaller pieces, and your solution will converge to the, the actual answer. And again, you know, I said that the, the physical process is, is approximated over an element. So uh, this one little different than my example. In my example, we actually had a known analytic solution over those little pieces, and we just wrote it down. But in the finite element, we actually uh, will approximate the solution. And we'll, the way we'll approximate it is uh, typically we'll have some unknown u's at discrete points j, those would be the nodes, okay, times some basis functions, so some approximation functions. Those are typically like linear quadratic polynomials, but you could actually use anything you want uh, to do that. And then you could also have some additional enrichment terms that we won't talk about in this class. And so in a finite element solution, there's always error. And it's important to sort of point out uh, 
the errors of where they can arise from. So one of them can be error in what we call the discretization. Right? So in this case, we have some arbitrarily shaped body, but we need to discretize it with either rectangles or triangles, some simple, some simple type geometries that we can have, that we can formulate the element solutions for. Okay? And of course, you can see here, if I use a very coarse discretization, so if I only have six elements, the best type of approximation I can do is very rough, right? I'm excluding all of these areas. Uh, I'm excluding basically all of these areas outside those triangles, right? And that can be a source of error in our solution. When I say error, I'm, I'm saying with respect to some you know, the real solution, which is not always known, but for simple problems, we can, for simple problems, it, you know, it is known and we can basically quantify the exact error. So the idea is, you know, then if we use smaller elements, well, we can approximate this a little bit better and we get better and better solutions. Of course, with smaller elements, we also have more of them and that increases the computational expense, okay? And so there's an, another source of the, you know, there's a discretization error that's due to the fact that we use triangles and hexahedrals and other things to discretize a, a, a really complex thing and we can't do it perfectly. And the other source of error is due to approximating the solution. So in other words, uh, you know, I mentioned that we're going to use some basis functions or some, some interpolant across the elements, and it's typically a polynomial, and sometimes as small as a linear, a linear polynomial, just basically the first term. And so with that, I mean, we're basically truncating the solution, and we can get more accurate solution if we use more and more terms, but again, it adds computational expense. Right? So the idea here is, you know, if our true solution is some quadratic function across our discretized domain, and we only use a polynomial approximation, then of course there's going to be an error. Right? We can't, we cannot replicate a quadratic with a with a linear function. And there's also computer-related related errors. Of course, you know, computers do computations in finite precision, right? There's always some round-off error in the computer. Now, today, where most computers are by standard 64-bit, uh, the round-off error is really small. And it's, it's, it's not as significant, typically, as uh, the discretization and truncation errors, which is a good thing, because we can, we can minimize the discretization and truncation errors at added computational expense, but we can do it, right? We can use finer discretizations, we can use higher order interpolations, and with more computational expense, we'll eventually converge to some solution. And so, uh, some other remarks, you know, w basically, we write down the equations for each of these little elements, and then we assemble them globally, right? And that's what we solve. So we assemble all the element equations into one big solution, and that's what we solve. And that assembled thing is singular. So you, you basically, we're going to solve a, a big matrix equation in a steady state problem that's basically like KU equal to B, right? So this is some big matrix. This is your vector of unknowns. And these are basically your, your, your boundary conditions. And so this K is actually singular until we impose some boundary conditions. So you know, the solution to this problem, obviously, is U equals K inverse B. right? But we cannot invert K until we impose boundary conditions. So the, the, the problems that we're looking at are, without boundary conditions, are ill-posed. We can't, we can't solve them. Okay, so you have to have the boundary condition. And, you know, 
so far what my little example and everything was without respect to time, but basically to solve time dependent problems, you discretize the spatial in space with finite elements. Right? So you start with a set of PDEs. So like those UP equations that we wrote down in class last time were PDEs, right? The partials with respect to space and time. So the way we solve time dependent problems with finite elements is we discretize with respect to space with finite elements, and we then have a set of ODEs in time, and then we discretize in time however we want, typically with, you know, your fav pick your favorite time integrator, central difference, or, you know, Runjakutta, or whatever you want to use. So, I think there was one more point I wanted to make. Oh, well, just the last part is also just a kind of a philosophical point. Finite elements in, particu in, in particular, but quite frankly, any kind of numerical analysis in general is part art, part science, in that you have to use your engineering intuition and make decisions about how you discretize it, what polynomial interpolants you want to use, and how much time you can give up to get a solution. Because you're, in, in numerical analysis and in finite elements, you're always trading off accuracy for speed for stability. All right? You can never have all three. You know, so there's, there's a sort of an art, and it takes experience and, and you know, many years of being a good analyst to understand how to get a solution that you believe in. <laughs> uh, and there's, I'll teach you ways to check, because you can easily compute a solution that'll be completely wrong. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you, you know, some ways to check if you know, the, if you believe in your solution, we'll learn that. Um, but then the other things are, you know, sort of how to get there the fastest is not always obvious, and it takes years of experience of being an, an analyst. In other words, you know, we can always start with some really coarse discretization and refine and refine and refine and refine. And if it's converging to an answer, we can believe in that answer, in most cases. But along the way, we may find that you know the computational expense of doing that is just too overwhelming and we can't, we can't deal with it. You know, it's taken weeks to get answers or whatever. And so then you, you might have to think of some other way to believe in your answer. And so we'll talk about some of those. And so with that, um, that's sort of my introduction and kind of overview uh, of finite elements. I did want to talk about some of sort of the mathematical background 